Book talk has been taking the world by storm, and I think none of us are strangers to that. From literal news articles, all the way to specific dedicated Barnes & Noble tables, all the way to authors getting almost the second wave of fame and immense book sales, it is just a force to be reckoned with. Quite honestly, like sometimes it's scary to think about the power that book talk and TikTok as a platform holds over consumers and audience members and just people in general. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like like it. And while there has been some debate by the looks of it about whether or not TikTok is dying, BookTok is dying, if the platform is going to see the end of its days the same way that a previous platform of a similar format, Vine, saw its downfall, and at one point in time, I was very much inclined to agree, I just don't know if that's the reality. TikTok has truly become a beast of its own. And when you think and compare the way that people have been reacting to this app with its short form content versus what we used to see in Vine. It is similar in ways, but yet it is so vastly different that I don't think it's going to be dying anytime soon. I could still be wrong. Past Mel could be right. The people who have looked at the platform and say that it's got an expiration date could also be right. But as of now, I think I've been converted to the mindset that it's not going anywhere anytime soon. And now because of that, I thought it'd be really cool to just come on here, chat with you guys, and just have a really nice, chill, cozy night where we talk about popular book talk books, literally the good, the bad, and the ugly, what I've liked, what I've disliked, what I think, my takes on it. I was initially thinking of just doing like popular book talk books that I've loved, popular book talk books that I think are worth the hype, but then I asked you guys what you wanted to see and you guys just said, give me all the tea, Mel. I want it all, like Queen said, and this Queen shall say back, I shall give it all. <laughs> or as much as I can give you because there's a lot of books that I still haven't read, but that is on the point. But you know what? Let's talk about the sponsor of today's video before I move on because I do need to give a massive shout out to FlexiSpot for partnering with me for today's video. Now, if you're a gamer, if you're a content creator, or if you just work from home and want a really great desk setup, FlexiSpot is probably the way to go. They sent my way the Kamhar all-in-one standing desk, and when I tell you guys, this is like the ultimate hub for anything to do with work and desks. It's got a keypad on the right-hand side which you can use to adjust the desk's height, meaning that you can work sitting down, or you can work standing up and you can adjust this to whatever height works best for you. And it also has a preset button, meaning that if you have some favorite heights that you like to utilize and you can also save those. One of my favorite things too is that it's got a really nice USB hub from USB type A and USB type C, meaning that you can plug things directly to the desk. And beside that, it's got a really nice spacious drawer so that you can fit in again, all of your cables, all of your annotation tools, maybe if you're a reader or anything and everything that you use on a daily to work. So if you guys do want to check the Comhar all-in-one standing desk or any of their other desks out, I will be leaving a link at the top of the description so that you guys can go peruse their site and see all that they have to offer. So thank you so much to them for sponsoring today's video and let's get right into it. And before I get started, I do want to hear you guys sound off in the comments about your TikTok opinions. What do you think about the platform? What do you think particularly about the subsection of book talk, which I think is very much aligned to what we talk about here on a daily basis? And what are some books that you've read because of book talk that maybe you've liked, maybe you've disliked? What are your takes on them? I think it'd be some really interesting conversation to have in the comments just because the topic itself is fascinating. And so because I had to structure this video in a way that didn't feel incredibly messy and chaotic like a lot of my sit down videos tend to be because anything I am the queen of chaos and uh, just doing things on the fly. I sat down and I watched TikTok a lot in a way that I don't think I've ever consumed anything on this platform. And I watched TikTok after TikTok. I also feel like doing a reading vlog in the past about experimenting with TikTok's favorite books or potentially some of their favorite books was a really good way to already kind of be in the know as somebody who's not on the platform every day, what TikTok is reading, what TikTok is liking, and what books I should read and analyze if I say so myself. And after doing my extra thorough research today and then going on every website that my little mouse could click on, I came to this conclusion. These are the books that I have read, not necessarily because of TikTok, just books that I read either because of the platform or books that I read when I was starting my booktube channel, books that I read as they were coming out, books that I read in high school. And these are the books that I read 
and loved that I see on TikTok all the time. And the reason why I chose to do it this way and just blast them on screen is because I talk about these books more than enough and I really don't want to bore you guys with the same books, same opinions over and over again. And then these were the books that I read because of TikTok, because of curiosity, because of my channel. And I didn't really love them. I didn't really love them, didn't really enjoy the reading experience. Some of these I DNF'd and it was just not a pleasant reading experience for me. As you can see, the list is smaller than the books I've actually enjoyed. So, so far, TikTok and I are somewhat mainly in agreement. And then the biggest list of them all is the list of books that TikTok has really hyped up that I have yet to read, but I really want to do so before the year ends. Now, this list is quite big. They are super hyped on the platform and I just really want to read them. Like they actually all sound super interesting. And I thought I'd include these on here just because some of these are quintessential TikTok books. Same way that The Love Hypothesis is one of those quintessential TikTok books. It literally has a TikTok sticker now. That's just the way that they're doing it now. Same as the Atlas Six, which also some copies do have the TikTok sticker. And then the Spanish Love Deception. When I think of these three books and some others too, I literally Really associate them immediately with the platform. The fact that Olivia Blake, between her incredible writing, because I'm honestly reading the Atlas Six right now and I'm really, really enjoying it, between her amazing writing and her amazing stories, and also the power of word of mouth of TikTok has managed to get most of her books, or a vast majority of them, traditionally published and bought by Tor Books, is just something to behold. Because we've seen it happen where self published books with TikTok become traditionally published, publishers see how much people are loving them and they want to give the people a revised edition, hardcover edition, and they just want to give people the full experience. In terms of power, it's just fascinating. I digress and this is why I don't do these types of videos because I get off point so much. So the point that I was saying, I don't remember what that was, but basically these are the books that I've yet to read but I really want to read. That's all I'm going to say because you know what? I forgot what the fuck I was saying and I'm not even going to try. I was lost, okay? I'm still lost. I'm just going to drink some water and pretend that everything's okay. And then finally, we arrive to the books that we're actually going to discuss in this video. So first, we've got Miss Colleen Hoover. And the reason why I mentioned Colleen Hoover is because I think she has seen a rise with TikTok. It's just been unprecedented. I saw several people talk about Colleen Hoover and her works before book talk and people loved her that you know there were tier ranking videos and, and you know it was a whole thing about which coho book is my favorite but I just don't think I've ever seen the hype with Colleen Hoover books as much as I do now she literally has a million followers on Instagram it's just factual for an author that is mostly unheard of and so the two books that I want to touch on which I feel are also the two books that book talk as a whole just talks about a lot are it ends with us and Verity both books that I read hello low because I'm only going to talk about books that I've read. I have a complicated relationship with Colleen Hoover. Now, Verity is a book that I read and I absolutely devoured it in literally three hours. The very idea of having an author who is on the brink of bankruptcy sign on a contract to co-write or ghost write the end of a series for an author who has fallen off the face of the earth without really acknowledging in the public eye exactly what has happened is just an amazing concept when put together with the thriller genre. And so you've got this concept of this author finishing this book whilst also trying to figure out exactly what has befallen Verity, whilst also finding out the ugly truth of Verity's life, her husband's life, the family's life, because she is literally staying at their estate, all with the trope of a book within a book, a manuscript in particular, was just amazing execution in my opinion. And I also think she uses horror beats so seamlessly in this story that even even though cheesy at times, it genuinely got me. Like, I was scared, okay? I was scared of the whole thing happening, and I really shouldn't have been, but it really just got me. And it was honestly an addicting read. You just wanted to find out what happened. The twists and turns were phenomenal. It was twisted, it was gritty, it was dark, and it didn't shy away from doing anything less than horrifying. And I love it. I also love the fact that none of the characters are really good, and there is that question of morality. So Verity is a book that I I absolutely adored and still to this day I think about it. How long ago did I read Verity? Two years ago? I feel like I read it two years ago. Still lives on my mind rent free. Now it ends with us I have a complicated relationship with. I read this and when I finished I was like yeah this is like a 2.5 like a three star and then I read the author's note and the author's note is the one that made me cry so the author's note got me more than the actual story. Now that's
that's not to say that the story that was written was not important because I think it is. However, I think there is a certain level of responsibility when you are writing a story that is potentially triggering for a group of people, a story about abuse and gaslighting and really being in a relationship where there is a big power imbalance and where there is a lot of lies and secrets and then pitching that as a romance without letting people know what the true content of the book is without really speaking about the trigger warnings and the content of the book itself because pitching it as a romance is also and this could also just be my personal take on it and I could be wrong but I feel in ways selling this book as a romance putting it on the romance shelf or even categorizing that on your website as a romance novel could potentially be romanticizing the idea of being in these sorts of relationships even if that's not the intent but when you call it a romance it's just immensely misleading and so while I think that the story itself is very important to be told I don't think also that the execution of the story itself was done to the best of its capacity though I do think there are parts of it that I see and I really really enjoyed because when I was reading the book I think also as a reader you're kind of bamboozled into thinking that the love interest is actually this this really you know hunky sexy alluring man but when you actually get into the thick of his character it really just does to you what he does to the main character and I think think there is something to be said about walking into a book and getting that experience that the main character also gets and really being challenged when you're reading to realize that noticing the patterns of abuse sometimes is not that easy and so that part of the book I really did like but do I think it could have been executed better yes do I think this book could be marketed better yes do I think the book fails in what it's trying to do at times yes next up on my list I've got a good girl's guide to murder this is a book that I read during a 24-hour readathon. And when I tell you guys, I seriously need to reread this book to see what I genuinely think. I am not even kidding because I was in my delusional state during the readathon in like the final three to four hours where I could barely keep my eyes open whilst entertaining and reading sprints. And I don't know where my focus or my brain went. But when I tell you, I remember nothing about A Good Girl's Guide to Murder. I'm being for real. I also feel like this book, there is like a separation here. There's like two sides. You're either a truly devious girly or a good girl's guide to murder girly but very rarely are girlies both I feel like that's what I typically see and I have to admit I'm a truly devious girly but I can be converted to splitting it down the middle or giving a 60 40 if it comes to that however the concept for a good girl's guide to murder and the structure of the story were both things that I somewhat if not very much enjoyed when I initially read this now the mixed media element I think is one of the strongest parts going for this book I loved seeing the diagrams and and the red string at the end which I know it tied up with the cover it was really really cool to see well not to see but to read about. You know what I'm trying to say. It was really cool having a set of interviews and I really love how curious the main character was and how determined she was to get to the bottom of this because essentially Pippa, the main character, as her final project in school, chooses to go further into the investigation process of a murder that happened five years ago in the small town that she lives in. One high schooler was murdered and it was believed to have been done by, I believe it's her boyfriend, Sal Singh. And Pippa doesn't think that Sal did it, but the police knows that he allegedly did it like they're hella convinced that this man committed murder Pippa will go to hell and back to prove that that's not right and to prove who the real murderer is however I don't know if it was my delusional state of mind at the moment or if it was just the fact that the book itself was forgettable but I rarely remember a single thing about this book beyond the mixed media element and the ending I do remember I really didn't like I felt like it was very out of pocket very random it wasn't really or at least in my delusional state of mind at the time I didn't think like it it was properly foreshadowed. I felt like there were no red herrings and I kind of felt bamboozled by a book that at the time, even then, everybody, because I also read this two years ago, everybody was raving about this. Everybody was loving this. And I was like, why? I don't get it. Like, wait. And so I was just trying to figure it out as I went. But this is definitely one of those books that I want to reread to see what I think about it now and if my opinion would shift in any way, shape or form. Because I feel like it would. If I actually sat down wide awake with some coffee in my hand, <laughs> I feel like my opinion would 
would be very different. The Inheritance Games. Let's talk about another book that I read in my delusional state of mind during a 24-hour readathon, shall we? I really need to stop doing this. I really need to learn that sleeping five hours during a readathon is not going to hurt anybody. It's actually going to really help me process books better because younger Mel really thought that staying awake the entire night and finishing seven books was absolutely phenomenal. And while it was, and I had a lot of fun, I also shouldn't have done that because the brain cannot take all that. But that being said, the Inheritance Games was one that I was really excited about. When you throw knives out out there and you say that that is the pitch for the book, you have got one Mel absolutely involved and absolutely willing and able to read, okay? A high schooler getting an inheritance from a billionaire that she's never met in her life whilst all of the grandsons are vying for this inheritance and they will literally do anything to get it is literally knives out. It is the most perfect book idea for a mystery. However, I don't know why in my pea-sized brain, I thought that this was a thriller. I don't know if I read that somewhere or if I just made it up, but I thought it was a thriller. It's not a thriller. It's a mystery. First of all, Mel, get that out of your freaking brain. At the time, I thought it was a thriller, so I went in with completely different expectations. On top of that, I feel like most of the book really was forgettable. The main character went through this whole media training process about how to dress, how to talk, how to address the media, and even the investigation process for her to find out why exactly she had inherited all of this money and then all of the grandsons doing all their little scheming at the end to get their cut and get their piece. And then the weird romance that we got with one of the grandsons, I really was not vibing with any of those elements. And so while I think it had a lot of potential, I feel it just kind of missed all of the marks. And I also went into it with completely different expectations. But who am I to talk? Because it's literally getting a special edition and the people will literally eat it up. Maybe I should do like a reading vlog giving books a second chance. Another quintessential TikTok book that I feel was one of the first few that really just blew up. This was really ground level baseline sort of TikTok popular book. If you do not read this, you have not made it into the cool club. Okay, like if people were entering book talk, this was kind of the entryway. And I could be wrong. And if I am, please don't correct me in the comments because it's literally going to haunt me for the next week. This and the Song of a Achilles were like everything people were talking about. This I read in high school and this I hated when I was a teenager. I remember reading this book and just feeling this absolute rage inside of me by how bad this book was. And you know what this did? Stick with me till this day. And every time I think about this book, I literally get angry. And that is just Teenage Mel's response because I literally disliked this in a way that I don't think I've ever disliked probably any other book, not even currently. It is a suspense and that is the first thing to know because there was nothing really suspenseful about this up until that crappy ending, which made no sense to me. And the writing, I remember, I was completely taken aback by. I literally just remember the disjointed sentence structure that I abhorred, okay? I did not like one second of it. And essentially, we follow this group of four friends as they go to this private island to vacation for the summer, if I'm not mistaken. That's, that's it. It literally has has no vibes and barely a plot. Like this book could barely string a plot together. And I still don't know why people like this. And listen, I've thought about it. I've thought about rereading this book now to further torture myself and see what I would think in present time. Do I want to subject myself to that? Well, I guess if I'm subjecting myself to a little life, I really can't handle anything, huh? But I literally read this the year it came out and I just looked it up. This came out in 2014. I was, yeah, I was 14 years old. 14 year old Mel does not approve. Next up, I've got Red, White and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston. And this is one that I actually really, really enjoyed. There are some things I want to say about this, which I've said before, but I'll reiterate those later. However, for the most part, this book I really, really enjoyed. It is almost set in this alternate universe where we have the first female president of the United States. And we particularly follow as one of our protagonists, her son, the first son, who is currently studying political science in college, but he has this sort of love-hate relationship with the prince of England. I won't even attempt a British accent because you guys will literally block me and report me. But he has this sort of complicated relationship with Henry where he is sort of envious of Henry, but at the same time really attracted to him, which is not something that he really wants to admit. And so when the two meet, they spark up this relationship that is honestly full of chemistry, just full of just love and 
all of the good stuff. They honestly have one of my favorite relationships in any book that I've read. And I just love their dynamic so much. I also love that the book includes this sort of mixed media element as well, where there's a text exchange and then there's also emailing. And honestly, those emails were everything. They were profound and they were beautiful and they were heartfelt. And they just added so much to the story. And I think the story also, although not very accurate, obviously, to how a real event would ensue if this were a real thing. And obviously, the monarchy side of it, I don't know how accurate or inaccurate it is. I wouldn't think that it's immensely accurate. It really does provide you within the romance genre with the best sort of escapism. And I absolutely loved that about it. Also is representative of whatever happens. Love will win. Love wins. And it is this beautiful encapsulation of, of love and friendship and relationships and what, what it really means to be supported by the people that you love and, and just staying true to yourself and just figuring out who you are, your likes, your dislikes, your sense of identity. And I love that. And it, and it comes with a but. I loved everything but the Latin representation of Alex, because I feel if you take away the fact that Alex is Mexican or half Mexican, it really doesn't make a difference in any aspect of this book. And I feel, and it was sort of the same issue that I had with One Last Stop, Casey McQuiston tends to fall into these stereotypes, which I definitely did not enjoy. It felt very infuriating to see my culture, not necessarily as a Mexican woman, because I'm not from Mexico, but as a Panamanian Latin human being. <laughs> I really didn't enjoy Casey McQuiston sort of reducing in ways his Latin identity and who he was and, and where his family comes from to, oh, if you like beans, then you know, you're, you're Mexican if you like beans, or it's just harmful and reducing stereotypes that we've seen time and time again. And it just felt rather poorly researched and poorly represented, which just is very disappointing. Beyond that, like the book is good. I just wish there would have been something better with that. The Song of Achilles is another one that we really saw Madeline Miller rise again. We truly saw the resurgence of Madeline Miller and truly the Song of Achilles. However, I think it's quite interesting that Book Talk claims that, particularly with the Song of Achilles, because I think we saw it a lot, this is such an underrated book. Why is nobody talking about it? Honey, it came out 10 years ago. That's why nobody's talking about it. And I think there's something also to be said about TikTok going through the 2013 booktube phase, which I know a lot of people have mentioned. It's a very big topic that people have discussed. It is no new introduction to this subject matter, but they really have been. I think now they're getting out of it. But when Book Talk started, they were really reading the throwbacks and really claiming that they were underrated books, which they weren't. They just probably weren't around to see the peak of those books when they did come out. The Song of Achilles, though, I think is a beautifully written an exploration of something that has been wondered throughout the years in regards to Greek mythology, particularly Patroclus's relationship with Achilles and the potential of them having been romantically involved. It is something that has always kind of been insinuated, something that has always kind of been questioned because the two were so close, whether or not there was even an iota of romantic involvement. And so I think Madeline Miller, having studied this, she really brings in sort of the nuances of Greek mythology and the sort of relationship and explores it in a way that is both lyrical and poetic and just really just phenomenal and beautiful. And I didn't think I would enjoy the book as much as I did just because I was kind of skeptical. I think at the time when I read this book, I was still kind of on the fence about those books that Book Talk kept talking about. I really did enjoy this. Were there scenes that were questionable and that I didn't really like? Yes. But I also think it's really commendable how Madeline Miller stays mostly true to the mythos. And I think there's very few things that she changed and the ones that she did, she kind of took that agency to do with it what she could to make her characters her own while still being representative of the stories that have been told for thousands of years. And I personally really enjoyed the book. I loved it. Cersei though cannot say the same, but Song of Achilles, that was really good. One that makes me really happy that it had its resurgence. Can I just say that? And I say that in a way that feels almost too bold because I have not read this book in years. Like I'm going on, I think a decade of like not having read these. When did the last book of this come out? I need to do some research. Okay, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it's still eight years. It's been eight years since I read these books. Loki been wanting to 
reread them, but that is the Shatter Me series. Particularly, and let me make the distinction, the Shatter Me trilogy, because for those of you who have been around for long enough, this was supposed to be a trilogy and I was bamboozled because I read these books back to back, okay? I was also 14 years old, literally read all of these back to back to back. And when I finished, I got a freaking open ending. I thought that was the last thing I was getting. And now there's three more books and like a million novellas. Will I read those? Absolutely not. I really kind of don't want to tame the memories that I have of Shatter Me. Just because I have very fond memories of the series at the time, 2014, this was one of those booktube staples that everybody was reading, everybody was loving. And of course, of course I went in there and I loved them as well. And I read them and it was just a great time. And it was also one of those first few series that I sat down and I actually binged. I have very few that I did that with back in the day, but Chatter Me was fortunately one of them. I loved the execution and the structure of having Juliet narrate the story, which is the main character, and have her jot down the sort of self-deprecating and almost self-hateful comments, and then scratching those out, and then writing down something that felt more positive, and it almost felt like fake it till you make it, girl. But listen, it kind of worked for Juliet. And so essentially in Chatterby, we have our girl Juliet, who has fatal touch, like literally she touches you and you like just drop dead, uh, which sometimes could be a great power to have, most times not a great power to have. However, uh, Miss Girl cannot touch anything or anyone. In fact, there is a reestablishment, which is the establishment uh -huh, that is governing the place that they live now. This is a dystopian, good to note. And they literally just lock her up in a cell because they don't think she is worthy of being dealt with. She was locked up for murder and they just threw her in a cell for her to basically waste away. Then they find out that despite Despite everything happening and despite what she did and the world hunger and all of the terrible diseases going around in the world that maybe Juliet could just be the one to save it all but she kind of has to make a choice like every uh, 2014 protagonist in a dystopian book. Do you want to be a warrior or do you want to be a weapon? And you can put two and two together and just guess what she did. I really liked this. It gave me heroes vibes. It gave me X-Men vibes. Just people with abilities, people with powers, fighting against oppression, fighting against being killed, fighting against this reestablishment. It felt amazing when I was reading it. I very much enjoyed this. I really enjoyed Tahira Mafi's writing. I obviously haven't read the newest books, like I can't really attest to that. I also can't really attest to the main trilogy in general, because I was 14 year old Mel. And can you trust her the same way that you can trust me right now? I don't know. But yeah, it was action packed. It had a great romance, okay? And it just also had a great hate to love moment, which I very much enjoyed the hate to love, the enemies to lovers. It was great. It was fantastic. It was, I think, one of the first few times that I experienced that trope of hate to love, enemies to love lovers and it really did work for me. There was just something so angsty about Juliet not being able to touch people and then what happens if she like falls in love with someone, you know, would the, would the kiss still kill them? It was really good. I really enjoyed it. Can you guess what's next? Is The Selection by Kira Cass. I also read this when I was in high school and I literally DNF'd the series when I didn't even know what DNF meant. Back in the day, I was obsessed with The Bachelor. I was obsessed with The Bachelorette. For those of you who know The Bachelor Pad, I was also, I was also a bachelor pad girly and it was great. It was great. Holly and Michael, that whole drama and then Blake coming in. Listen, it was a great time. However, and, and I digress <laughs> to the main point of the story. No, I need to stop. I need to stop making like these little references. I need to digress is what I need to do. Point is, I read this book and I thought the concept was genius. I was like, oh my God, this is like the bachelor, but like for a prince. And I genuinely was excited because that was just, you know, 14 year old me. I was probably 14 also. I don't know when the selection came out. Out. I read it and there was everything to be desired by the end. I didn't really like the love interest. The main character was literally terrible. She was boring and bland as hell. Her name is literally America. America Singer. Isn't she a singer too in like the book? Doesn't she sing? Isn't that like her little talent? Wasn't there like a whole talent show moment? Oh, I also remember one scene where every girl got scared because they were like, oh my God, we're being attacked. And they all had to hide. And of course she was like, I don't want to be here. I have like my boyfriend back home. Like, like I'm here because I have to be and like y'all are just like 
bitches be scared. It was, it was honestly exhausting. <laughs> it was exhausting and it was boring. I'm kidding. Maybe boring is not the word because honestly, if I think about it, it was quite entertaining. But the whole love triangle thing, which was barely a love triangle to begin with, was just so bad. And the way that the book ended, I cannot express to you. When I read the ending of this book, I literally, thank God I didn't own this book because I borrowed it from a friend. I literally gave it back to her and she's like, do you want to read the elite? I'm like, no, thanks. I'm good. And still to this day, I've been good. <laughs> Neon Gods by Katie Robert. Oops. <laughs> I never know if her name is Katie Robert or Katie Roberts. It doesn't have an S at the end. It's Katie Robert Mel. I should know this by now because I've literally read like five of her books, but I still don't learn. Also left everything to be desired. Another book that I didn't really love, and I think I'm going to give up on Katie Roberts. Ert. <laughs> I keep getting it wrong. I think I'm giving up on Katie Robert, period. Because when I tell you guys, I, it's just gone downhill. I read Desperate Measures. That one does have an S at the end, doesn't it? I read Desperate Measures and I really liked it. Red learned my lesson, really enjoyed it. A worthy opponent, didn't like it. The Beast, hated it. Neon Gods, didn't like it either. Katie Robert just keeps trying to put plot into her books. And listen, sometimes books can be porn and I'm okay with it. I am okay with it. Learn My Lesson was literally just porn. And guess what? It was phenomenal. But Neon Gods, what is happening? It has a vague world building. The sequence of events barely makes sense. The romance is literally strung together by a freaking thread that is already breaking apart. And the steam is not even that steamy. And the people out on the TikToks be saying like, oh my God, spice level is so high. I'm like, girl, where? What levels of steam are you reading that you think this is high? Girl, are you about to go to church to confess if you read Learn My Lesson? Because it's got nothing on that book. It's even got nothing on Desperate Measures. And so I feel Neon Gods left everything to be desired, especially as a Hades and Persephone retelling. Ice Planet Barbarians is another one. The point where it also got picked up, got redesigned covers, and it's just been a whole phenomena of literally people loving blue aliens and their alien dicks. It's actually enjoyable. <laughs> like, I actually have a good time with these. You follow a set of women who were literally kidnapped by aliens, and they are dumped out of this cargo ship, and they land on this really weird planet, which literally has blue big dicked aliens, <laughs> and and they get dicked by said aliens. But I think it's actually quite interesting that the way that the world building is like set out to be. It's also just really interesting to see, I guess a human being and this alien sort of interact and reach this common understanding of what they're there to do, what their relationship is. It's quite enjoyable. Is it like the deepest thing you're ever gonna read? Like obviously fucking not, but for the memes and the memes again, like if it works, it works. Kiss the Sky by Krista and Becca Ritchie. Now this one, I really, did love this one just gave it all to me I love this book so much now I, there is some level of apprehension on my end because I don't know if I should read the addicted series or not it just doesn't sound as interesting as Kobaloway I feel like I spoiled myself with all of the goodness and just all of the amazing parts of this relationship and it's like now I don't want to go to anything else get on it read it love it just relish in the vibes we follow Rose Calloway who has has her own fashion brand. However, because of a scandal that happened with her sister, her family kind of fell out of grace, but she does come from a very wealthy family. And in order to kind of come up again and reinstate her brand and reinstate also trust and love towards her family in the way that they used to see it, she decides to sign on for a reality TV show where she will be the protagonist alongside her two sisters, her own boyfriend, Connor Cobalt, which is the love of my life. I love him so much. One of my book boyfriends. Hello. I literally, I drooled a little. So he also comes from a very wealthy family. He works for his mom's a business, her empire, in the hopes of one day inheriting that himself. And he is like, I've said this before, but like Christian Grey fucking wishes, like Christian Grey wishes he could be the sexy, dominant, yet soft man that Connor Cobalt is because he just walks into a room and it's like all eyes on him, like gladly so, take my eyes. And so we also follow another one of her sisters, the one that's the main character in the Addicted series. I've already forgotten her name. Uh, Also her and her boyfriend. I just keep thinking of Lorcan and I'm like, no Mel, that's, that's Throne of Glass. Whatever her boyfriend's name was. And then, her other sister and then Garrett? <laughs> 
<laughs> Not me forgetting every name, but Rosas and Connors. Anyway, this is like reality TV drama goodness. A lot of it is like over dramatic, but I feel like it works for this particular setting. The romance between Connor and Rose is also everything because they're rivals to lovers, academic rivals in particular. So you apparently in the Addicted series, you really do get to see like the start of their relationship building up to Kiss the Sky. And if anything like that, I do want to witness, like maybe I will read the Addicted series. But now that I think about it, I'm just, I'm just making myself want to read it. No, you're so good at this. Anyway, to the last book of this video, I have probably another book that just saw like its new peak on TikTok. And that is The Cruel Prince by Holly Black. Now, this book is like not an underrated book by any means. It wasn't five years ago and it isn't now. Was it even out five years ago? <laughs> I know the last book came out in like 2019, but I think we're no strangers to people loving Holly Black's books. Literally The Cruel Prince, she's got like one or two more series in the YA genre. And then she's got the Spiderwick series, which was like really, it's it's very big, it's, it's massive. I retried it after DNFing it. And I have to say after giving it a second chance, it was actually really enjoyable. I think it was really interesting to have a YA series, which I think most YA fantasies do have, or at least back in that time, you know, 2012 to like 2016, uh, probably even I could, I could push it to like 2019 from like the, the database on my brain, which is just like me eyeballing shit to be quite honest with you. But I really do think something that dominated in that time and I still do think it does today, like don't get me wrong, fantasies with a strong romance subplot like are big. They've always been big in the YA genre. However, I was really surprised to find out that The Cruel Prince was the opposite. It had a romance subplot, but it really was not the focus of the story like at all. And it was mostly political, which was something that again, took me aback. I was very surprised by. So I think it's at that point point in time, and I'm pointing out to the particular time frame that this book came out in, I think it was very difficult, at least within the books that I was kind of observing or consuming, to find a book that wasn't centered around the romance or where the romance wasn't a big part of it. And so I think when you enter this book with the right set of expectations, where you know like people are going to be cruel and people are going to be bad, I, by people I mean the Fae, where the Fae are going to be a bit more representative of what we typically see in the Fae lore, where it's going to be sort of this bully romance where, you know, there's not going to be a bunch of fantasy elements to this, but it's mostly, again, that 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 politic, the war, um, the scheming, and then, you know, people being conniving. And I think, again, if you enter this book with the right set of expectations, you can really leave it enjoying the experience. And so I found myself doing that when I reread it and actually gave it a fair chance and entered it kind of knowing what to expect. The second book is by far the best one out of the three. Like the second book really just took me out. It was so freaking good. And and the novella, How the King of Eltham Learned to Hate Stories, I also think was phenomenal. And all of these characters, like they're all very complex. Do I think that these books would have benefited from being longer? Yes. I think the, the exploration of the characters and the world and the plot itself would have been way better executed as the books would have been longer. But I also think part of the appeal of the books is that they're short. So I'm kind of at a standstill with that one. But I do have to say, I've been converted to liking The Cruel Prince. Is it like a new favorite series? No, just because it's very inconsistent for me. But the experience itself, like I actually really enjoyed kind of binging the last two, three books, including the novella, obviously. It was a really enjoyable experience. And that is it for today, friends. That is the discussion for... TikTok books, are they worth it? The good, the bad, and the ugly. I still don't know what the fuck I'm titling this. So I'm just like spewing a bunch of words to see if anything sticks in my brain. But that's it for today. I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a thumbs up down below. And also just comment down below. What are your takes? What are some books that you have enjoyed? Maybe not have enjoyed? What are just some books that you observe on TikTok a lot? Maybe would you even like a round two of like me reading book talk books or perhaps me retrying books that I read a really, really long time ago to see what I think about them now? Let a girl know down in the comments if you reach the very end of the video. Let's leave a cloud emoji just because we've got thoughts today. Don't forget to subscribe down below if you haven't done so already. I am constantly uploading videos and I'm sure you do not want to miss. And if you want to support the channel further, I do have a Patreon. It's always linked down below and that just helps keep the channel going. So if you would like to pledge, if you would like to join the Citadel, you can do so down in the link in the description. And alongside that, you'll find all the links to my social medias. Thank you so much once more to Flexi Spot for sponsoring today's video. Don't forget to 
also check them out at the top of the description so that you can click the trusty link if you would like to invest in one. I love you guys so, so much, and I shall see you on my next one. Bye, guys. Mm -hmm.